everyone, welcome to another episode of Be Seen TV. I'm your host, Will Wilson, and we have an action-packed episode, which includes a two-part feature of the legendary former athletic trainer of the NHL, Bearcat Murray. We also have some interviews with some of the Hitman players, where they tell us about their upcoming season and exciting future endeavors. Joining me a little bit later is true local celebrity you know from the Calgary Sun Sports column, morning show host on Jack FM, and weekly panelist of Hockey Night in Canada's hot stove, Eric Francis. He'll be talking about his charity for kids sport. Get prepared because this is BC TV. Today's star guest started his career as an athletic trainer here at the Corel. Working as an NHL athletic trainer, he helped the Flames win their Stanley Cup in 1989. And now he has earned his way to the Hockey Hall of Fame. Here is Bearcat Murray. With people, when I, when I was a kid, people calling my dad Bearcat, I was quite proud. Well, all of a sudden, he calls me Bearcat, the same writer, the same guy in the paper in High River, but he says, we got a bear, another Bearcat plan, but it's in Okotoke. So my kids, my friends, my everybody started calling me Bearcat, and that's the way I inherited it. But I was very, today, to this day, I'm very proud of it, because it was my dad. Into the old corral, here we go. Can you describe what it was like to work in the corral? It was awesome, because I was the guy, one of the players, our hockey team in Okotoks, was the first team to play in the new Stampede Corral, 1950. So we were quite excited, and this was a Sunday, and we always played a doubleheader Sunday uh, coin collection for, for people to watch the games, and we just had a hoop, but we had a tremendous hockey team league in those days, it was called the Big Six. And uh, Okotoks, when we got involved in with that, we played there. Well, we just had a great time. So from day one, we were the first in the crowd, and I'm proud of that. And here we are here again, right there. And the World Hockey went up, and on where the standing room is, and drew two lines. I mean, it wasn't any wider than my two feet. And that was a season ticket for that little square of white up there in there and it went all around the rink and that's the way things went on from then on. So everybody had a little square up there other than the seat and it was unbelievable. Phil hanging out of the rafters and uh, I always thought we were going to get shut down by the fire department because <laughs> they were just there. Unbelievable. But it, you're right, you know, it, the crowd was, but it was great. We loved the crowd, but I had a lot of injuries. It was, the boards were built against cement. And, you know, like the cement came part way up the boards and the boards, and the, the people, the guys hit that and go, oh, whoa, they were hurt. Now everything gives, you know, the whole boards gives. So it was, it was not fun. And plus the boards were that high. They were shoulder high and every time they get hit, we'd get shoulder injuries. It was, it was just bad for that. And then getting on and off the ice, well, they didn't have, they couldn't jump over the boards unless there were antelopes, you know. So they had to use the gates and stuff, so it made it unfortunate. And when they jumped up off of the bench, going there, well, whoa, it was a long way down to the ice. There was a lot of problems with it, but we had it, and it was fun. Oh, here we go. Centennials, or uh, uh, Flames. Big opening, 27th of December, 1980, in here, and, uh, that's, and that's what they did with it. See the big box up top there? And they built all that, put the stairs in. All these guys are famous. Oh, 
I had no idea I'd be in something like this. As a matter of fact, in school, in high school, I was scared to death when we had health. The health class, I'd run out and leave. I'd, Whoo, all them pictures of those hearts and in guts and stuff. I didn't know. <laughs> no way. So I, when I did become a trainer, I was quite surprised. But it all came uh, later with my friend that uh, moved to here from back from Saskatchewan. You know, it's a long story about all that. But he was my hockey train uh, coach and my center man. I played hockey with him, and it was senior Allen Cup type hockey. So he came to. Uh, live in Calgary and I was quite happy about that and he, and he said, Becca, he says, I just bought, or we just bought the hockey team here in Calgary, the, the uh, uh, Buffaloes, which was a junior team. And he says, we're going to call them the Calgary Centennials and we've started a new league here called the WHA, which is now the WHA. And uh, we're really going big time here. We're, <clears throat> we're playing all all across Western Canada and partly in the in northern states. So he says, uh, I would like you to come and be my trainer. I said, Cease, where are you going? But his, his name was Cease Papke. I said, Cease, are you kidding me? I mean, <laughs> I'm an oil patch guy. I'm a, I, I do all the sales and service and oil patch. What do, what do I know about training? I used to train resources and stuff. But anyway, he, I said, well, are you going to pay me? And the jury says, I'll pay you. I says, he says, what are you making now? So I told him, he says, oh, we can handle that. I said, okay. Went home, told my wife, I'm going to be a trainer. Where he went. And I didn't think I knew anything. I didn't know anything. You know, I, 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 got, I ended up with a lot of friends, a lot of people, and everybody that helped me. But I could sharpen skates, and uh, little did I know from my experience before as a teenager, I was a jockey. And while I was a jockey, I would work with the horse trainers. And I learned all about how to train a horse and how when they're injured, when they're sick, when all the other things are going on, I learned about this. And of course, growing up in Western Canada with, with farmers, I was out there all the time with them, cattle, horses and what have you, pigs, chickens, and everything related to this type of work. So I just fell into it and when things happened, I just knew what to do. But Certain do you injuries also do a lot of studying on your own? I did after. When I, once I started, I was studying steady, and, and I got piles of books, and I got in all these medical magazines, but I had enormous friends here, and one of them became my mentor, and which really taught me was Alec Reske from, with the Calgary Stampede football team, and he later brought me in as assistant trainer for about five years in the late 70s, just before the Flames came. So I learned an enormous amount from him. Along with that, I had... Uh, uh, the uh, emergency um, uh, ambulance people that taught me uh, all about first responder, which is what I needed to know with the guys on the ice. And I taught them how to tape uh, and uh, support joints and what have you, which was really valuable to them on the road and on the highways when they got people injured. So we helped each other. And I had, we had a battery of doctors. That, there were there probably seven or eight doctors that continually helped me with really medical problems, you know, sickness, um, major injuries, things like that, that, that they really helped me with. So I learned a lot in very quick time. Stay tuned for part two to hear about the legendary NHL trainer, Bearcat Murray. Bearcat Murray has so many wonderful stories to share. He'll also be joining us on November 12th for the Pizza Pig Out, hosted by Eric Francis, which is here with us right now. So can you tell us a little bit about what the event is? Uh, well, it's a, it's a contest. It's open to every restaurant, deli, uh, diner, uh, pizzeria that has pizzas on their menu, or you may not even have pizza on your menu. We want you to bring them down to Cowboys on November 12th. We'll probably have about 300 of them this year, uh, and we'll have about six or seven hundred people at Cowboys November 12th um, to help judge and that will include about 150 celebrity judges like yourself <laughs> like Bearcat, Kelly Rudy, Brian Burke, uh, Craig Conroy, Mark Giordano was there last year and a number of the Flames will come down again this year. Uh, the list of uh, local celebrities will be long. Uh, people can't pass up the opportunity to have free pizza in unlimited amounts is what really gets them I think. Uh, a number of the Stampeders will be there as well too, including Charleston Hughes, who submitted a pizza last year. So anyone can get in on the action. And uh, we're all doing it for three uh, charities who I, uh, who I believe very strongly in. 
Great, and this is being hosted at Cowboys Dance Hall on November 12th between 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, the charities that are benefiting from it? Well, the first one is Kids Sport Calgary, and you know, for all, this is the 12th annual Pizza Pig Out, and uh, they've benefited all 12 years from it. You know, I've been an ambassador with them for years because they do such great work. It just amazes me in a city as wealthy as our beautiful city that there are still some families that struggle to the point where their kids can't play sports because of their family's financial situation. And kid sports always been there to help alleviate that burden and get kids off the sidelines and into the game. And that just makes me so proud that they've never ever turned anyone down in the history of kids sport Calgary. And uh, the Pizza Pig Out is, is a small part of, of that. Um, the You Can Play Project, uh, Brian Burke's son, uh, who passed away several years ago but you know he was gay and uh, he always wanted to be known that it didn't matter what your sexual orientation was you can play sports if you want to play sports you can play sports it shouldn't have be an issue at all and the you can play project you know goes to great lengths to make sure that that message gets out there and then of course the last one is the big give project which is along the same lines of uh, the kids sport Calgary they're right here in Calgary it's a it's a handful of good pals Adam Woodward and Dave Wilder, who make sure that their kids at the grassroots level, they see them in the gyms. If their shoes aren't right to play sports, they make sure they get shoes. There's so many other things that they do, but suffice it to say, they do great work in our city. Wow, that's fantastic. And of course, uh, how, do, how do you get tickets for this, this event? Uh, Eric Francis Pizza Pig Out .ca is where you can go to get tickets. They're just 35 bucks, it's unlimited pizza. And there's also some beverage sampling there. Cowboys is famous for that over the years, if you, if you didn't already know. Uh, you know, you get to rub shoulders with, with all the guys I spoke about earlier. Uh, big names in this city, Katrina LeMay Doan has been in the past, Brett, Brett Hitman Hart, uh, Doug Flutie. It goes way back. There's a long history of uh, pretty much anybody who's anybody, if that means anything in our city, has been to the Pizza Pig Out. So uh, you can rub shoulders with them. And it's an instant conversation starter if you're sitting there trying a pizza for the very first time in your life. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and then where can they find uh, the results of the Pizza Pig Out? Uh, yeah, the, the whole thing is done really. The idea originally was for there to be a pullout in the Calgary Sun with the, that would be the definitive guide to ordering pizza in our city. Everybody craves pizza from time to time. Everybody wants to go out for pizza every once in a while, but they want to try new places. So this guide will be in the following weekend after November 12th in the Sunday paper. It'll be about five or six pages full of great photos of people like yourself and also all the other celebrities. And there will be uh, the results of best veggie, best deep dish, uh, best uh, meat lovers, most unique. The list goes on and on and you'll find there's something for everybody at the pig out. Fantastic. Well, it's really exciting. So we're going to be seeing a lot of famous people there, including Bearcat Murray and the Hitman. And we also scored some interviews with them about their upcoming season. The Calgary Hitman had an early exit out of last year's playoffs, taking the Kootenai Ice to game six, but coming up short with a 5-3 loss. The Hitman lost three veteran players, Brady Brasser, Jaden Riesling, and Alex Roach after the season ended. Although the Hitmen didn't capture the champion's title in 2014, they came off a very triumphant season, where the club only lost 17 times in the 72 regular season games, leaving new head coach Mark French with high expectations for this season. Hey, we're here with Kenton, the captain of the Calgary Hitmen, player number three. So you guys did pretty well last year going to the Eastern Conference quarterfinals. What are your goals for this year? Um, this year we want to just start off by um, kind of getting together and um, getting used to the new systems with the new coach. Uh, Mark's been great with us. Um, we we're happy to have him. He's been a great coach. Um, um, we just want to continue to win games. Um, don't want to look too far ahead, but at the back of our minds, we want to keep winning and uh, have a really good, uh, strong playoff run. And last year you had a really great season, so what are your goals for yourself this season with the Hitmen? I'm um, just to continue to perform. Um, I just want to work hard and work on my defensive game. Last year I was more of a D-man than a forward this year, so I kind of want to work on my wall work and D-zone because it's a little different as a forward. But uh, just to continue to work hard and perform and be a leader out there. And we heard that you were named captain. I just wanted to say congratulations. How does it feel to be a captain? Uh, it's a huge honor um, with this uh, organization and uh, all the guys on the team. We have a lot of great leaders on this team. And just to be named captain is just a, a huge honor. I was very excited about it. Awesome. And we also heard that you signed with the Anaheim Ducks. Tell us how it feels to be signed with an NHL team. Uh, it's unreal. Um, I look back, I think two years ago is when I first got drafted by them. And when you're drafted, it's not exactly quite the same. It's, it was 
pretty exciting day to get drafted, but to officially sign and be a part of the team was uh, awesome and a great feeling. So do you have any advice for any aspiring hockey players, young guys that want to make it just like you did? Um, just to put in the extra work after practice. Um, things like uh, working hard and working on little things like maybe for younger guys, you're shooting or you're skating or anything just to help you become a better player out there. And uh, all the little things, uh, when they say practice makes perfect, it, they're not lying. Uh, you pr it takes a lot of practice to get better at what you're doing. So just keep working on everything you're doing. And I think I heard you saying, and I think I read too, that you've been switched from forward to defenseman. Mm -hmm. So what was that transition like? Uh, it was a little odd uh, going back and forth, doing the systems and getting going from be getting hit as a DMN to getting in on a forward check as a forward. It was a little all over the place last year, but I'm a full-time forward now, so I got that in my mind. I don't have to worry about going back and forth this year. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, have Good luck this year. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks. French brings vast experience to the coaching staff with over 19 years experience in six different leagues, including two very successful seasons with the Calder Cup champions, the Hershey Bears. French comes to the Hitman from head coaching position of a KHL team in Croatia. I'm standing here with number 26, Connor Rankin. Hi, thanks for meeting with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Tell me a little bit about being a part of the Hitman this year, because you were a part of a different team last year. Yeah, right? obviously, yeah, it's obviously a great honor to be a part of the Hitman. Um, obviously, I have a really big tradition of winning, and um, that's what we're trying to do this year is to win a championship. And, uh, you know, at the end of last year, it was kind of disappointing losing out too early uh, to Kootenai. So, uh, you know, everyone's eager this year to get back to it and start winning again. And you had a really great season last year. Tell me a little bit about what you want to do this season to get even better. Uh, pretty much just continue to get better in every area of the game, offensively, defensively. Um, and obviously, we have great forwards, great defensemen, so it's kind of hard to find a role that the team needs. So, uh, you know, basically just being an all-around player and improving in every step of the game. So you are from Alberta. Is it pretty exciting to be playing for a team that's close to home? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, obviously, it's uh, always exciting playing in a big city like Calgary, too. So, um, you know, it's just exciting to be uh, a part of a team that's close to home, obviously, and, uh, you know, being close to everyone that knows me. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have any advice for any aspiring younger kids that are looking to make it into the WHL? Obviously, just to keep working hard. Um, you know, that's you just got to love the game. Uh, it's really easy to, uh, you know, play hard and work hard if you're having fun and obviously you'll succeed if you're doing something you love and um, that's how pretty much all 22 of us got to this point is we just love the game and it's, it's pretty easy going out to the rink every day and doing something you love. Awesome. And just uh, tell me a little bit about training camp before the season started. How was, was that very stressful for you or? Um, yeah, obviously training camps, I'm not going to lie, it's probably the worst part of the season. <laughs> you know, you got to do all those hard skates and those workouts and fitness testing and all that. So. Um, you know, I'm glad it's over with, to be honest, but uh, I think it was really good for our team. We actually had a really good training camp, really good preseason. Um, obviously, that's a big part of what happened last year. I think we're all eager to get back and, you know, get revenge on Kootenai and the whole WHL. So, uh, you know, obviously, it's, I'm happy it's done and over with and we're on to the season. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. Uh, good luck this year. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> The Calgary Hitmen will begin a seven-game road trip starting in Swift Current October 31st, ending with a match against last year's first-round knockout, the Kootenai Ice. They will be back in the Dome November 16th, taking on the Saskatoon Blades. After losing out in the Eastern Conference quarterfinals to the Kootenai Ice last season, the Calgary Hitmen are looking to take it all the way this year. Currently, the team ranks in the fourth position in the Eastern Conference, and it's looking like it's going to be a great season. We're wishing them all the best here from BC and TV. I'm Ashley Taylor. Thank you, Ashley. You can catch the Hitman games right on Shaw TV. Earlier in the episode, we talked to Bearcat about what it was like working as an athletic trainer in the Corral. Now he talks a little bit about what it was like growing up. Bearcat Murray earned his way into the Hockey Hall of Fame, but of course not without a few struggles along the way. Let's get to know Bearcat Murray a little bit more. I was born in Vulcan with hospital from my parents, but my parents at that time were, were, were my dad was working in Blackie, which is just a few miles away, and he ran the uh, Alberta Pool Elevator. So I, I remember a lot about Vulcan because of my grandparents, and I remember being in Blackie and, and uh, how lucky I was to be able to jump on the train and go to and go to Vulcan. Now in those days the roads were just dirt and nothing to them, so the train was 
awesome. So we had a great time with that. But growing up in, in Blackie, I'll put it that way, that uh, I remember uh, everything about that. And of course, there was a dirty 30 thing, and that, that was very serious. My dad was fine because he, he was getting a paycheck because he ended up working for the wheat pool elevator. And uh, so we were all right, but I can remember little stories like one of uh, going to visit my really good friend and his dad owned the, the garage and service station in Blackie and they were upstairs above their service station. I go up to visit them and it was dinner time and, and, I, and they said, come on in Jimmy, we'll wait. He's, he'll be ready as soon as, we, as soon as we finish dinner. And they asked me if I wanted some. I said, no, I'm fine. I just had dinner and I look and I sat there and I, I'm looking at the food and a bowl. And I said, why are you eating porridge for dinner? And nobody said it. And I, I just so that was fine. No answer. I never did get an answer. So we took off and went playing. We had a great big time and everything. But I find out later that that wasn't porridge. It was boiled wheat. And they got the wheat. My dad gave it to them. And without that, they would have never survived. And everybody in town was doing that. And uh, so I grew up thinking, well, wow, this is really something. You know, my dad is a neat guy and he's helping all these nice people. And then all of a sudden we start getting people coming to the back door and my mother would say, sit down and she'd come up with a big plate of food. My dad sent them over and they were guys that engineers, doctors, what have you, very important people coming from Eastern Canada out to Alberta to work. And they were riding the rails. Rails, they called them bums. But but it was they, they would come over, and my mom would feed them. My dad sent them over, and I thought, oh, wow, this is really something. So I grew up knowing charity uh, from the time I was born. Uh, uh, how how important it was, and how how it was with the, with the town and with the city and 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 with the people around there. So um, it was a great start, and it's never stopped. Well, my dad, way back in the dirty 30s in those days, they had all kinds of words and sayings, but pot liquor was one of them, and, and it was, I didn't really know what, I finally asked my mother what she thought about, what, why might, does my dad call me a pot liquor? A little pot liquor, he called me all the time. So, I, so she explained it, that she, when she made a cake, it was made from scratch, and she'd make the cake in a big bowl, and the mixture up, and then she'd make the icing in another big bowl, it was chocolate, I'll put it that way, okay? So when the little bowls were empty, I was a big pig, I wanted the big bowl. And my sister got the little bowl, which was the best part, but it wasn't as much. And so I would just get right in there. And it. So that's, he called me a pot liquor. It was a pot. Do you but, still do that today? Pardon? Do you still do that today? Oh yeah, <laughs> you betcha. But it was, it was uh, back in those days, and that was a, it was a saying, not, not because I did that, but that my mother told me that. But everybody used that word, and you'll see nowadays when I say it, and it's automatic. I say it, and I, uh, and I finally I tell everybody, well, it's better than swearing. <laughs> so I can I can do that and get away with it. But uh, it was it was just a, a thing back in those days, and and, uh, and I kind of enjoy it. That time. Yeah, this was the way I got my job. There's another part of your career where you were running up um, some of the stone steps and you twisted your ankle during the game and you were taken out and uh, because the cameras were staying on you for so long, you started blowing kisses to yeah. the audience. Can you describe that a little bit? You've been studying, haven't you? Yeah. Well, what happened was uh, Gary Souter lost his stick and went flying up into the crowd right beside the bench and uh, it was big high glass all around us in the bench and my son was assistant trainer and he was trying to get there to get the stick and I'm looking around and Gary's yelling, you want me to get my stick? So finally Alan, uh, I went underneath the stands because to, to, the guy right there had it under their feet and I was going to sneak in and grab it. Well, the stairs were covered underneath so I come back out in the bench and I just about had a heart attack. My son's in the crowd and they're fighting over this hockey stick. So I'm thinking, oh no! So over the glass, I just leaped like a leopard. I went over the, I went over the glass, and I came down on the steps that were there. They were like this, and that my one foot hit the steps, and <laughs> just it was this foot actually, and that, and down I went, and it just twisted, and I, I broke it. I just thought I broke it, but anyway, we, I get up and I'm hobbling along, and we grab the stick and everything. The guys gave it up. And uh, we came back, climbed over the glass, and I let me down, and I'm crawling on my hands and knees, moaning like an old goat. <clears throat> and the guys come up, and, and they wonder what's the matter. I think I broke my leg. 
So they hauled me on a stretcher out towards the dressing room, and as I'm going out, here's the camera like this, lights on, and 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 look, and I, oh, it's on. What's going on? So I'm throwing kisses. I said, this sore as can be. I mean, you're really hurting. And out we go, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nut with the camera. Eh? So, Guys give me a bad time about it. Anyway, we get out of the dressing room and the doctor checked me all over and they didn't know. I said, but anyway, let's go to the hospital. So out we go. Stretcher out and here's the camera. Following us all along the hallway, way down to the end of the rink and around, and here's the ambulance. And they're with them in the ambulance. Look, here's this darn camera. Still with the light on, so I'm throwing more kisses and, and goodbye, and away we go to the to the uh, <laughs> to the hospital and we get there in the x-ray and and it was okay so back we come put a cast on back we come come in the crowd there's that guy with the camera again when we're coming back in and then next thing i'm just i just hop off of the thing and and jump into the uh onto the bench so we're there finish the hockey game we're not there the guys in boston are sitting there watching this game and i and i said they're a bunch of drunks but they're a bunch of good guys but they were in the bar across the street from the from the gardens, Boston Gardens, they call them the Gardens, and uh, they were saying, "Look at this!" They go, they pull away from the camera to film this important guy, and the game's on. How important is this guy? So that's our guy. We're gonna, and they started the fan club right there because of that whole situation, and that was it. Then later, a bunch, a bunch of kids from Calgary here that were going to school to McG at McGill in Montreal started it up and it was a bigger fan club but never got the ink that, that the Boston guys did but that's how that happened it was I couldn't help it <laughs> going uh, six games which which you know it wasn't seven it was six it was really uh, good for us but yeah you know I, I've got a little story because Bobby Stewart was my uh, equipment manager and a tremendous guy just a tremendous guy been in it a long time and uh, and he was very sharp and, and always on the ball and and we were in uh, I don't know second third game we're in Montreal and we're on the bench and I looked up in the in the old in the old forum and then looking for the scores of the other hockey games and I and I'm, we're busy hey, going the game's on and I find I said Bobby why are you when he's going by Bobby come here so I says can you get the scores up there I can't see any he says okay one, just give me a minute and we're starting there and pretty soon he came back he said bear. There aren't any scores. No, you were the only ones playing. And that's when I realized what was going on. We were the last two teams in the league, and that hit me hard. I said, oh, my God, this is unreal. So it was pretty exciting. But we had exciting more time before that it was in 86, playing against Edmonton and beating them out. So we finally went up to the Stanley Cup playoff set, but just beating Edmonton was the most biggest thrill I ever had. Wow, how exciting was that? Well, that's it for Be Seen TV. If you have any upcoming events or stories you'd like to share with us, feel free to email us at bcentv at shop.ca. Or you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Wilson. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Will Wilson, and see you next time.